Jimmy, we'll start with you. Why don't you introduce yourself and say why you're running? Sure, great. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jimmy Crumpacker, uh, running for the 5th Congressional District. I was born and raised in the 5th Congressional, um, just outside of Portland. Um, I went to the same uh, public school that my grandfather went to, same school that my uh, parents actually met at when they were, you know, four or five years old. So uh, I have deep roots here in the 5th Congressional District. I'm Family's actually, I'm seventh generation Oregonian. So uh, our family came out in 1845. Um, I've been living in Bend uh, the last four years. So I have kind of a unique view of, um, of uh, uh, sorry, something just popped up. A unique view of, um, of the fifth congressional district because I've lived on both sides of the, um, of the mountain range. So uh, I uh, went to Georgetown University where I studied government, um, interned for Senator Gordon Smith. Um, and from there, I then um, was going to go right into service in government, but a very smart woman told me to uh, hold off and um, come back into government service after I've been in the business. So I uh, went and worked on Wall Street for 16 years. The last 13 years, I was in the energy business, um, and I was focusing on uh, trying to make uh, America energy independent. I moved back to Oregon about 10 years ago and got very involved in the community um, in the Portland metro area, um, was on uh, five nonprofit boards, including um, delivering Meals for Meals on Wheels, as well as sitting on their board. Um, yeah, so I, uh, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm running for this position because um, I think that the issues facing the voters right now uh, inflation, um, uh, federal timber policy, um, and world affairs are, are critical, and 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 th those really speak to my um, uh, to my knowledge base. So uh, th this is this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I care deeply about Oregon, and you know I don't have the opportunity to move to Idaho, so I'm going to stay here and fight. Madison, uh, why don't you go ahead and say why you're running? Uh, Ma Madison Oatman. I'm 30 years old. I'm a construction worker. I live in Bend. I was born in Bend. Um, grew up in Oregon, raised here. My family is generations here. I don't know how long, but uh, I'm an Oregonian. Never really thought about moving. I've always thought about just staying and fighting the politics that I feel strongly about. Um, but I'm running for congressional district number five because I'm tired of seeing the same people in office. Um, we've had people in office for over 40 years, it's longer than I've been alive, longer than most of my generation has been alive. We need to get involved um, for the younger generation. We need to get our voices out there and be heard. Um, I'm running just for those reasons. I feel like my individual freedoms um, are being trampled on by the government. And, in particular, we've had a lot of overreach, um, people trying to tell us how to live our lives the last couple of years, um, you know, how to conduct, conduct our medical freedom, um, particularly, why, particularly why I'm running. We also have um, a pretty economically a pretty tough situation happening right now. A lot of people, especially in my shoes, are, you know, struggling whether it be with gas prices, inflation, grocery prices, all that stuff that uh, we just need to get under control, especially on a federal level. Um, and then our freedoms as far as Second Amendment rights go, um, feel like those are under attack as well. And that is why I'm running and kind of putting my name in the hat, so to speak. Thanks. Um, we'll just flip back and forth. So we'll start with you with this one, Madison. Why are you the best person to um, take this job of all the Republicans running in this primary? I feel like I'm the best person because um, we need somebody to stand in there and say what's on their mind and speak for Oregon. We don't have anybody in office that stands up and speaks for Oregon and tells people, no, this is wrong. These policies don't make sense. It doesn't make sense for the public. Um, you know, I'm a construction worker. I get a, you know, firsthand experience talking to a lot of those guys and the policies that affect them. Um, we need to make common sense policies. We need somebody in there that's going to speak their mind and that's going to tell people that, no, it doesn't make sense for everybody, whether 
they agree with me or not, if it doesn't make sense for the common public and the people who put them there and they're not speaking up to protect those rights, um, we need that in Oregon. I feel like I can provide that. Thanks. How about you there, Jimmy? Why are you the best Republican running in this race? You know, we have had a, um, uh, a, a great advantage of being able to raise a lot of money. Um, and in federal races, that is extremely hard. Um, we've outraised all of our uh, competition combined. Um, and we have to do that, you know, a couple hundred dollars at a time because of the federal limitations on, on fundraising. So that's really important. Um, I think my work in the community, um, uh, resurrecting a uh, arts organization from bankruptcy and helping save 250 full and part-time jobs was critical. Um, I also was on the board of uh, Portland Japanese Garden and helped raise $37.5 million. Um, and in what is, you know, one of the biggest tourist draws in the state of Oregon. Um, I think my knowledge of economics um, is, is going to be critical, especially with inflation running at 8.5%. We're at 40 year highs. Um, so being able to speak um, plainly and clearly about that and being able to pro problem solve in Congress is gonna be really critical. Um, I also think my knowledge of the timber industry, both my grandfathers were in the timber business. So um, that is gonna be really important. Um, I am you know, very fortunate to have been endorsed by um, Oregon Firearms Federation and uh, Oregon Right to Life. Um, I also um, was endorsed uh, by the Oregonian on Sunday. So, um, you know, these are all organizations that take deep dives into candidates and, and really uh, understand where the issues are. And, and I think that that's really important. Jimmy, this one will come back to you uh, to start. You know, this is a newly reformed district. Can you describe the makeup of the district and how your priorities align with the majority of those voters? Yeah, I, I mean, this is a brand new district. So I think I am unique in this race because I've lived on both sides of the mountain. So I really understand that there's a rural urban divide. Um, people outside of the metro area in Portland um, feel as though Portland really dominates politics. And, and that's unfortunate. Um, and, you know, that is true to a degree, especially in Salem. But um, I think a, a big advantage a Republican would have coming out of this district is um, Republicans are going to be in the majority next year. And so having more than one Republican in the federal delegation is going to be critical um, for Oregonians. Can I just ask a quick follow up on that? In terms of the numbers for your district, um, I mean, nationally, perhaps that, you know, Republicans will be in the majority, but what about your district? Right, so we're basically a 50-50 district. So if you look at um, the number of Republicans and Democrats that are registered in this district, it's it's pretty close to even. So um, I know in 2018, um, the, the, the gentleman running for governor as a Republican won this district by uh, almost five points. Um, Biden did win the district by I think nine points. So this is a district that will swing back and forth. Thanks for just that clarification for anyone curious and watching. Madison, uh, do you want me to repeat the question? You're muted. I'll repeat yes. the question. Can you describe the makeup of the, of the district and how your priorities align with the majority of those voters? Um, the makeup of the district, like Jimmy was saying, it spans across um, a wide variety, whether it be um, urban to rural areas, um, the makeup of the district is pretty diverse. I went, I grew up in Salem after my parents moved us over here when I was younger. Um, I've lived in Salem, I've lived in Bend, um, I've lived in those rural communities as well as the urban communities. Um, as far as how we can help this particular district um, and overcome the, you know, the Western hemisphere of the state for the Eastern side is we got a pretty diverse district now. And we're, um, I think East I-5, basically all the way down um, Woodburn, a lot of urban areas got cut out of our district. And we got some of those smaller rural communities like Mill City and those areas. And that's where our vote's gonna come in as Republicans and having a Republican 
in office is going to be key, especially like Jimmy was saying, if we win the House um, in 2022, having multiple Republicans represent Oregon is going to help get a lot of that stuff done for Oregonians, whether it be rural issues, um, timber, you know, unlocking timberlands, water, stuff like that, that can help both sides of the mountain in the urban and rural areas. Um, hopefully we, I know it's a toss up in this district and hopefully we can win that seat. This is just a little bit of a, a, an extension of that question, but um, we'll start with you again, Madison. What are some of the challenges that you've faced in just campaigning in this district so far? Um, challenges for me is I work full time. So I'm a full time construction worker. Um, I, you know, I have to balance work and um, campaigning, right? Uh, I don't have any money. I don't have anybody backing me or endorsing me. Um, I'm kind of self funded. And it's difficult. I have a difficult time getting my name out there and difficult traveling back and forth between all the areas that are involved in my district. That's probably the biggest challenge for me. Um, just balancing that work and um, life as well as campaigning. You know, I got upkeep on my property to do. I got work to attend to. Um, and then I have family on top of that that I need to address. And that's probably the most difficult part is balancing getting to all those areas. Um, you know, we have, I think, eight different counties in our district. I have a hard time just visiting them all is my, that's probably my biggest downfall. Thanks, Jimmy. Do you uh, want me to repeat that question? No, uh, you know, uh, Madison is right. Uh, this is a very hard district just because you have to go back and forth across the Sanium Pass a lot. Um, and as we've all seen, the snow, especially recently, has been really bad. Um, I um, will admit that I did not take my um, studded tires off, although I was supposed to on April 1st. But, you know, we had to uh. deal with a foot of snow last week in, uh, you know, in the San Am Pass. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge to keep going back and forth across the mountains. I had one trip where... You know, I was supposed to be in Mill City for a lunch. Um, I got up to um, Hoodoo and uh, it told me three hours to Mill City, you know, which is right. You know, it should be maybe 40, maybe 50 minutes max. So you know, it, it's, a, it's a challenge going back and forth across the mountains. Um, switching a little bit uh, deeper dive into some of the issues. Uh, and Jimmy, we'll start with you on this one. Um, what do you think Congress's role should be in addressing pandemics or uh, national health crises? That's a great question. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we have to rely heavily on the executive branch for that, um, for the leadership. But um, I think what uh, Congress did in 2020 was uh, very appropriate um, when the economy gets shut down, uh, providing um, ample aid to uh, businesses was critical um, because the economy really came to a standstill. Of course, I am worried that the money was very easy to come by. And so I think what we're seeing now, a few years later, is there's been dramatic fraud within the PPP organization. Um, and I am worried that that is going to be one of the, um, uh, as we look back, it's going to be one of the programs in U.S. history that was fleeced more than almost any other. But, uh, you know, they, they try to get money out as easily as possible to as many businesses as possible. So um, I would say moving forward, um, we need to stop spending so much money. Um, so I, I, I don't support, move, you know, more spending. Um, uh, as, I, as I was mentioning before, eight and a half percent inflation is, is you know, it's, it's crushing working families. Madison, I'll repeat the question. What should Congress's role be in addressing pandemics or national health crises? I think Congress's role should be, like Jimmy said, they did a pretty good job funding. Um, I don't think their role should be anywhere near shutting down the economy, telling businesses what they can and can't do or who can and can't remain open. That is not Congress's responsibility. I think they should have done more funding research, 
and more of just letting the CDC give out guidelines, not enforcing in guidelines and letting Americans choose for themselves whether they want to wear a mask, be vaccinated or, you know, any of those things. We're all smart individuals. We have common sense. We can decide for ourselves if we want to wear a mask or be safe. Um, I think Congress's role is to help, you know, put out guidelines and fund research and, you know, the CDC and all that stuff so we can get a handle on those health crises. But um, I don't think that they should have told the, you know, smaller businesses to shut down and that should have never been a part of it. Same with the states. Um, we should have never had a hand in that. Are you are you saying that you're, it's your impression that Congress did that, that shut down businesses? No, that was states individually shutting down their, you know, every state has its own power to do those things. I just think as a role of Congress, we should have never, or Congress should have never um, got behind any of that. We should have been having our Congress come out and been against that. Um, we should have voiced the not shutting down the, you know, economy as a choice for Americans. Um, Congress should have stood behind the small businesses. They should have stood behind all businesses in general and the American people. Um, states, obviously, are going to do what the states are going to do because we have it separated out that way in our government. But Congress should have never been involved in that. It should have just been strictly funding and, um, you know, not get all that funding um, kind of theft wise and being fleeced, as Jimmy put it. <laughs> Um, we should have had a better handle on that funding. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. You both of you mentioned, or at least uh, Jimmy, you mentioned inflation. Um, we know that inflation is affecting many Americans' lives. It's a, it's a global issue right now, not just in the US. Um, and I think we're back at starting with Madison with this one. What should the federal government be doing to control inflation, if anything? Uh, we need to quit spending money. Um, first and foremost, the more money you print, the more is available. Um, if we have more money in circulation, your dollar becomes worth less. It's not uh, rocket science to figure that out. And then we need to get people back to work. We need to quit paying people to sit at home. We have paid so many people through the COVID pandemic to, you know, whether it was staying at home or with government subsidies. Um, now they're not working. So we don't have anybody producing products to meet the demand of products. And then we're printing money on top of that. So they have more money at their disposal, but there's no products to meet that demand. Um, so it's kind of twofold there. We need to quit spending money on a federal level. And then we need to be able to encourage people to get back to work, whether it be creating jobs in the forest industry or the energy industry, um, letting our federal lands be open to drilling for oil and get those people back to work. Um, that'll go a long way to helping our inflation. Um, at this point, it is pretty high. Um, so it's gonna take, you know, quite a bit to get it back down there, but that's where you start is less spending and getting people back to work. Do you have specific places in the budget that you would propose cutting, um, stop spending money um, at the federal level? Federal level, we were just talking um, with one of our other interviews. They're proposing some more COVID relief. Um, at this point, we just need to quit spending money, right? Whether it be COVID relief, um, you know, we're the infrastructure bill is a lot of money in that infrastructure bill, but there's no one working to build that infrastructure. Um, so we have $3.5 trillion that were just infused into the economy. And then some of that money went overseas. We need to quit sending money overseas to help other countries and worry about us for the time being. Um, once we can fix us. No, by, the, by, the, by the infrastructure bill, no one's working. And my impression that was going to go and put people back to work. It's supposed to, right? It's supposed to get people back to work, but they have so much money at their disposal um, from the government paying them through COVID that they may not be going back to work yet. We haven't seen that yet where they're, we're starting to see the unemployment levels drop, but are they actually going back to work where did the unemployment just run out for them and they have money set aside and saved up from not paying rent and you know the government giving them a bunch of money. 
um, that's we're not seeing them get fully back to work yet. Um, and that's where I think that money from the infrastructure is, yeah, it's meant to get people back to work, but I don't think they're going back just yet. Um, I see it every day. I work in construction. It's hot. It's hard to hire people. It's hard to get them to show up for interviews. It's hard for them to, you know, even complete the interview, right? Um, we need to make an incentive for those individuals to actually show up, get a job, get back to work. And then that infrastructure bill, um, it can take effect, so to speak, but we've spent a lot of money and time um, in the last two years on people not going to work. I'll just repeat that question for you, Jimmy. Um, so inflation is affecting many Americans' lives, including as well as people uh, worldwide. Um, what should the federal government here in the U.S. be doing to control in inflation? Uh, I would echo what that's saying. The um, federal budget needs to be cut. Um, unfortunately, when Kurt Schrader, who is uh, currently holding this seat, when he came into office, the federal deficit was $8 trillion. Now it's $30 trillion. Um, unfortunately, we are spending money that we don't have, and I actually believe it is a an Achilles heel for um, for national security in the U.S. Um, and if interest rates go up dramatically, then our interest payments on $30 trillion are going to be um, a huge, a huge um a barrier for us to have economic growth. Um, so, and I do believe that is this is really uh, the U.S. has been uh, out front in this. Um, even if you look at uh, left-leaning um, uh, economists such as Larry Summers, he was warning about not spending the money that uh, the Biden administration put through the economy last year. And it's almost guaranteed when inflation's over 4% and unemployment's under 4%, we're going to head into a recession. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it's almost guaranteed. And when the Federal Reserve, uh, when we've been in this situation the last 10 times, um, uh, they've only managed to get out of it uh, two out of the last 10. So for me, it's, it's it, we are in um, a very dangerous part place economically. Um, and unfortunately, inflation really hurts the, the people that can least afford it. Um, it hurts the families uh, where they have to make a decision between spending on fuel and, and, um, and rent and, and food. Um, and that's not a decision that Americans should be forced into. So you so you cutting spending, specifically where? Uh, I think outside of defense, you want to cut spending across the board um, for the most part. I mean, unfortunately, we need to uh, cut back the federal budget. Um, you know, it's uh, I have a lot of because I went to uh, university in, in D.C., I had friends that went into the real estate business in Washington, D.C., and that is the best real estate market in the in the country because the federal government just keeps growing and growing and they never get smaller. So um, it, we're at a dangerous position right here. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, uh, it's it's something that needs to be curtailed. We'll leave it at that. Jimmy, uh, we'll start with you again. Um, what is your approach to uh, combating climate change? I think the number one thing we need to do in Oregon is stop the forest fires. Um, you know, I uh, was reading statistics recently um, that uh, a forest fire in British Columbia it was about 475,000 acres, which is almost the equivalent of the forest fire in Southern Oregon last summer. Uh, the 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 carbon that was released because of that forest fire was the equivalent of 8 million cars driving for a year. Um, so if you can imagine, um, actually, you know, I've heard one of my opponents say in the past that uh, every forest fire season in Oregon is the equivalent of three years of driving um, on Oregon roads with all the cars. So uh, the number one priority we should have, and especially in Bend, as you guys probably remember last summer, our AQI was the worst in the world. Our air quality index, I think I thought I said it was 400. I think Madison actually corrected me and said it was 600, um, which is worse than Dubai and Mumbai and Beijing. And so uh, from uh, simply from the perspective of, of um, the, uh, the health of our seniors, our pregnant women especially, 
Um, being able to curtail forest fires should be our number one priority from a federal standpoint. Do you have a specific um, methodology in mind? I know you, people are usually like, a, let's burn it, let's cut it. Um, they usually fall in some camp. Sure, I think you can use a combination of all three. Um, there was a great article written about um, the forest fire down in Southern Oregon last year where I believe it was Oregon State University had an area that they had thinned and then they had taken out the underbrush and that area survived much better than all the surrounding areas. So th th there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, you know, I would love to get back to having 85,000 timber workers like we had when I was a kid, uh, because that were those were 85,000 uh, firefighters um, because they were in the woods as soon as a lightning strike would happen because they were trying to protect their living. Um, unfortunately, with only 25,000 timber workers, we have the workforce has been reduced dramatically. Um, and I think another another key thing that doesn't get talked about a lot is our satellites are so powerful now, um, especially our military ones, that um, if they were trained over the Western United States, we'd be able to pick up um, small burns and it would be smart to put those out right away. Unfortunately, this policy of only fighting fires once they get to a certain size uh, is not working. Um, and when, when fires grow to a certain size and the winds change, then all of a sudden you lose control of those fires. So I think putting out fires early would be a really smart thing to do. Um, but at the end of the day, we need better forest management. Um, you know, the federal government manages 53% of the state of Oregon. That's 32 million acres. And it, they have not done a very good job, um, especially the last 10 years. Yeah, there's so much more that we could talk about in terms of just the um, the human use out and near our forests in the um, this particular area. But we'll uh, we'll move the question on to Madison. I think at this point, Madison, do you want to repeat it? No, um, climate change. Um, there's a couple of things that the government can you know help with um, as far as climate change goes, managing our forests better. Um, all those things can play an effect, but as far as clean, clean renewable energy, which most people are worried about, I think the government needs to stay out of that and let the private sector kind of handle that. Um, private sector has always outdone the public sector as far as, you know, innovation goes. Somebody somewhere is going to figure out how to make a clean renewable energy source that's going to push America to the next place. Um, it makes no sense to cut off all of our fossil fuels, coal, you know, oil, all those things that have America right now. Um, we need to let the private sector kind of take over on that front. If you look at SpaceX, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, all those guys, they're out doing NASA and they're sending rockets to space all the time. Um, they've outdone the government in the space industry at this point. Um, we just need to let the private sector kind of handle the climate change as far as clean renewable energy goes. And then as far as managing our forests and our timber, we need to manage those better, you know, clean the forest floors, whether it be prescribed burns, logging, all the things, thinning, we need to make sure that um, we take care of our lands. Um, I'm an avid hunter. I love going outdoors and I love protecting those things that I love to do, right? And that comes with not burning our forests down um, or having forest fires that are destroying communities. Um, we need to clean our forest floors and take good care of them. We're stewards of the land um, and we need to be as such treated as our own properties that we like to take care of so much. Um, that's where the federal government can help with that and provide the funding to the logging industry and those industries to make that happen. Thanks. Uh, another major issue for folks in this district certainly is childcare. Um, what does, what's Congress's role in addressing this issue? Back to you, Madison. Um, I personally don't have children yet, um, but childcare is a pretty big issue, right? Um, I think that child care is a tough one to be involved in um, as a government is concerned. I believe that the parents are in charge of their children. If you want to have kids, 
take care of your kids. Um, at the same time, if we're short on childcare facilities, we need to make it easier for people to start those facilities, right? Uh, we need to make it easier, less regulations on letting people start daycares and childcare facilities. Cause when it's kind of a supply and demand issue, right? You have a lot of children. So there's a lot of demand for childcare, but we don't have enough childcare facilities or daycares or what, what have you to take on that responsibility. I think we need to, as a federal government, make it easier for people to start a childcare facility and maintain those. Um, that'll go a long way to helping bring down the prices of childcare as well. The more competition you have, the lower the prices get, right? Um, it's kind of an economic thing as well. As far as the government's concerned, that's kind of the only avenue I see for them. I don't want them to be involved in too much of my life as far as child child goes um, and child care goes. But if we could make it easier to get those facilities up and running, that would go a long way to, you know, bring those prices down and make it more available. Jimmy, how about you? What How does uh, Congress play a role in helping with the child care crisis? Yeah, it's it's very difficult for Congress to play a role in that. Um, I think it's a local issue. Um, I, there are certain things as far as uh, child tax credits that Congress can do, um, which can help um, parents. Um, I, I certainly think that that's something that Congress can do, but it, it's, a, it's a challenging situation. Um, you know, I believe in limited uh, federal government. Uh, I believe issues are best solved at the state and local issue, uh, sorry, state and local level. So uh, th that, you know, having, having the federal government directly involved in child care, I think is, is, is too much of what we've already seen, this expansion of the federal government. Fair enough. Jimmy, I'm coming back to you. I think there's a pattern yeah. here. I'm getting, I, I'm starting with you every time. She's <laughs> starting with Madison. I think we figured that one out. Yeah. Uh, so Jimmy, this one uh, starts with you. Can, can Congress help address the income inequality that is leading to rampant homelessness in our country? And in it, you know, what is Congress's role in that? And I know you're both um, conservative candidates and for a smaller role, but when you have a crisis that's this large, especially for Oregon, where we're seeing it's so high visibility um, right now, um, what are you going to do if you're elected to this position? Well, I think the, the number one thing you can do, and I sound like a broken record, is fight the inflation issues. Um, I think that, as I was saying before, when people have to decide between food and gas and uh, rent, you know, that is, uh, that, that's a dangerous uh, mixture. Um, and I do think that um, there are states and cities that are handling homelessness a lot better um, than we are in Oregon. Uh, I, I, I look at San Francisco as a very cautionary tale. Um, you know, they are spending, uh, they used to spend $100 million on homelessness. I've heard the numbers now up to $460 million. And homelessness has actually gotten much worse in the Bay Area. Um, and I think what it gets down to the bottom line is there's not enough accountability for the homelessness services. And um, it, it's, it's to the point where, uh, unfortunately, we are allowing um, uh, drug addiction and mental health care crises to, to um, exacerbate the issue. Um, I lived in New York City for a long time. Uh, New York spent $230 per person on homelessness, uh, whereas San Francisco spends uh, almost double that per person on homelessness. And yet uh, the homelessness in New York City is a fraction of what it is in, in uh, San Francisco. So there are cities that are doing it much better. I look at a city like Houston or Miami where they actually have a much better uh, problem solving when it comes to homelessness. Unfortunately, Oregon, especially Portland, we're seeing it now in Bend, um, you know, uh, the, the, their solutions are not working. So, um, you know, from a federal standpoint, it, it, it's challenging to deal with them. Madison, can, the, can Congress help address income inequality that's leading to the rampant homelessness in the country? Um, kind of just reiterate what Jimmy said here is, you know, inflation economy, right? That's the federal government can help in that 
aspect of it. If we get the cost of living down across the board in the country, that makes it easier for some of those people who are in a situation where they can't afford a home and they are homeless. Unfortunately, here in Oregon, a lot of our homelessness, whether it be mental health crisis or drug addiction, um, that's a huge portion of our homeless community at this point, especially in um, Oregon itself. We've de decriminalized drugs um, to a certain degree, right, for a certain amount that you have on you. Basically, you get a slap on the wrist and they can continue on. doesn't matter what type of drug it is. Um, we need to help fight keeping the drugs off the street in Oregon, that would go a long way to helping homelessness as well. Um, for some of the mental health issues, we need to have, you know, a better funding and a better system for some of those people who have mental health issues so we can better help them and better under, understand how to get them off the street. Um, but as far as what we can do on a federal level, it's just get that inflation down, the economy back up and running um, so everything's not so expensive. Alrighty, back to you again, Madison. Um, another philosophical one, is student loan forgiveness a viable option in your mind? And if so, how? Um, no, people decided to go to college. They know how much it costs. Um, they should have been prepared to pay those bills. Um, if you go out and buy a car, they don't forgive you for you know buying the car and not being able to afford it, right? Um, school's the same way, I believe that everybody we all have the opportunity to go to school, right? Um, I myself did not go to college, dropped out of high school. You know, I did all those things when I was a younger man. And, uh, but I understood if I wanted to go to college and I wanted to go back to school that I was gonna have to pay for it. Um, the fact that people are complaining that they have so much to pay for, they knew what they were getting themselves into when they signed up for it. So for us to forgive that is just, helping you know make them reliant on the government um we need to encourage people to you know when they look at school we need to be able to help them go to the correct school um all those things but you look at universities um our highest paid state employee is a football coach for a university <laughs> right why does he need nine million dollars a year to do you know run a football program um we need to figure out how to cut. Yeah, we need to figure out how to cut spending within those universities to make it cheaper to go to school. Right. Um, that's how you're going to solve people paying so much for school. It's not forgiving the debt. It's figuring out where to cut spending in those state run universities. Unfortunately, from a federal level, um, I don't think we're going to have a role in those state universities, but forgiving the debt is not how to go about it. Over to you, Jimmy. Can we is student loan forgiveness forgiveness viable? It's a good question. Actually, this is the first time I've had that on the campaign trail. So kudos to you guys. Hey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's a challenging question. I realize it's really popular right now, but um, as Madison said, it's not fair. Um, it's not fair because you know uh, the most educated people that that really should have the best preparation for the job market. I don't know if those are the people that we should be giving the breaks to. Um, I think there are people that are less fortunate that didn't go to universities and colleges that that deserve uh, federal money much more than they do. Um, I, I, uh, there are also comp a lot of complicated issues that come along with it. Well, you know, what if you made your last payment um, in, uh, you know, June 30th, and then July 1st, all of a sudden, the federal government says, oh, you know, we're forgiving all the loans. How does that work? Um, do you then get a check back if you had just paid off your student loans? So it, it's, it's, it's a very arbitrary um, decision that I, I'm worried that the federal government is going to give away um to the people that uh, should be the most best prepared in, in the job market yeah hi jimmy um starting with you um i know this question is going to sound like a no-brainer but i'm going to throw it out there anyways because in the past we've had uh 
representatives. When we were in another district, this is a fresh start, uh, but if you were elected, would you commit to regular town halls in the counties in your district? And if so, how frequently do you think you would be uh, getting around? It's a great question. And I've stated all along, I will um, try to do a monthly town hall in, in, in the five counties in this district. Great. Addison? going to have to get around this district even with your even with your workload so. right um if i was elected yeah i would commit to weekly or monthly depending on what your schedule is right um for the congress obviously i have no experience in government and how that how their schedule works but um i would be happy to have town halls all over my district right talk to people um see what their thoughts are on how we're running the country what we can do better type deal. Um, you know, that's one thing that why I'm running is you don't hear from our representatives. You don't hear them coming to your town or town hall and speaking. Um, and that's why I'm running because you just, they just go off into the sunset and you never hear from them again after you elect them. <laughs> so yes, I would go yeah. to town halls. Thanks. Uh, getting close to the end of the questions here. We're almost to the end guys. Don't worry. <laughs> Um, this one starts with Madison. Um, water issues are clearly a big issue for a lot of the Western states, as Jimmy pointed out, over half of our land in Oregon is federally owned or publicly owned in some fashion. Um, how can Congress support localities in addressing water shortages and drought? Um, we can give that power back to the local and state levels, right? Um, the federal government, you know, has its hand in a lot of states right now we need to get that power back to the states and then the states need to figure out a way to regulate that water and usage a little bit better than what we have um so the federal government we can take a step back from a federal government standpoint and give that power back to the states and the local levels and that would go a long way for the state to be able to figure out how to give that water and get that water to the right areas like our farmers and our agriculture um, getting those water those water rights back to those individuals and the states goes a long way from a federal level here's a little follow-up question for you so um a lot of uh you know the irrigation districts are run by um arcane state law um do you think the state particularly Oregon right now is, is doing a good job in managing its water, um, <laughs> just water rights, I guess, is the best way. To um, particularly, no, I think we can get a lot better at managing those water rights and distri distribution of water, right? We're in a drought, um, I feel like every year, right? <laughs> every year, Oregon says we're in a drought, and it's been going on for the last decade um, or more, I don't think you know, in 2016, we had a huge winter and, you know, we had what we're in bend, I think it was like four feet of snow forever, it seemed like, and we were still in a drought. How is that possible? <laughs> you know, how's that possible? People were skiing on July 4th up on Mount Bachelor and we were still in a drought. Well, it's because we're not managing that water properly um, or reserving some of that when we do have low snow levels and water levels that come in through the winter time we should have been better prepared for that than what we have been in the past. So I think the state could be a lot better at it. Thanks. So Jimmy, we'll start with the original question. How can Congress support localities in addressing water shortages and drought? That's a very challenging question. Um, uh, what, what's the old saying? Uh, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. Um, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's right. You know, it's it's hard because, you know, as you were saying, um, we have these uh, water rights usages that, that have been passed down over the last 100 or 200 years. Um, I think from a federal level, you can certainly look at, um, you know, all the water that uh, is going out the Columbia River. Um, I believe it's five trillion gallons a year. Um, are being deposited into the Pacific Ocean. Um, so if there's a drought somewhere in Oregon, uh, the, we do have potential um, uh, with, with all that water in the Columbia River Gorge. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a very challenging question. Hmm, interesting. 
And is there is there anything that you think if you're elected as a congressman you could do to to change that or alleviate that? Um, I mean, those water rights are still federal water rights. Yeah, I, I, it's you know th there are certain things that you can do. Um, certainly, you need you need to get everybody on the same page. Um, it's it, it's a hard issue though, um, and and one I'd have to study more to be quite frank with you. Okay, fair enough. Um, Jimmy, uh, I'll start with you. Do you believe Oregon's elections are free and fair? Um, yeah, you know, I, I am disappointed that, that we don't vote in person. I think that that is something that when I was a kid, we used to do, I used to go into school with my dad. And, um, I think that that's important and, and it would be good to get back to. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, uh, I, I do believe our elections are are free, and um, and I just want everyone to be able to trust them. So I think in this year's election, we're going to have more eyeballs on them than ever, and I think that's a good thing. When you say that, uh, when you say you want in-person uh, voting, is that to the exclusion of mail-in, or in addition to mail-in, do you support the current mail-in system? You know, I think it'd be better to go away from the mail-in system, to be honest. I think it'd be better to do everything in person. Uh, obviously- What's your, the, what's your specific the, 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 concern with mail-in? Um, my, the, the concern I have is that um, it's harder to check um, exactly who's filling out a ballot. You know, it could be filled out by your neighbor. You know, it could be filled out by your grandson you know it so I, I i think it's in you know i think it's a valid thing to say hey you know show up um show an id you know i, I don't think that's a huge barrier to voting madison your thoughts um yeah oregon you know i don't know a whole lot about um if we had any controversy here in Oregon, but since we went into the mail-in ballots, um, we have been strictly democratic state for like the last 40 years or something. Um, I think we are pretty fair for the most part. Um, I haven't had any issues personally with voting, but I would like, just like Jimmy, I would like to bring back in-person voting, go into the ballot box, dropping it in. Um, I think that there's a way to do both, right? If you choose, you know, you want to do mail-in ballot, um, that's on you. If you choose to go to the ballot box, that's on you, but you only get one choice at the end of the day. Um, I would like to see that be um, kind of how we run that. Do you want, if you get something mailed to you or do you want to go in person, you don't get both type deal. Um, I think that's harder to control when you have, you know, people getting in mail and ballots. Um, my grandfather passed away probably, you know, four or five years ago. Um, and I still got a ballot in the mail for him. Right. Um, and my grandmother got a ballot in the mail for him. So we need to figure out how to keep that from happening. You know, when somebody is, whether they be deceased or they don't live in that house anymore, we need a better system for keeping control of who gets ballots and who doesn't in the mail. Uh, I just have one more question for you both. Start with you, Madison. Um, who's the commander in chief and were they freely and fairly elected? You know, um, that's a tough question to answer. I am on the side of there were some things that happened during the election that I was not entirely sure were correct, right? Um, as far as the commander in chief, um, you know, I may not like it, but right now it is Joe Biden. Um, I may not agree with him and I may not, um, you know, like the results of the 2020 election. Uh, do I think that there were some discrepancies? Yes. I think that when you're watching, you know, at 11 o'clock at night, Trump was winning and it was by a landslide. And the next morning you wake up and he's lost, right? Um, oh, we had to stop the counting in the middle of the night. Well, that doesn't really you know, in my mind, didn't really work out. Um, and the math didn't quite add up there. Um, and I'm not, like I said, I'm not the most educated individual, but I got some common sense that when you watched it, it didn't quite make sense. 
There's a few local elections that the opposite happened. I wish that they would have flipped the other way from from the night to the morning, but hey, you know, counting goes on. Um, yeah. Jimmy, who's the commander in chief and were they freely and fairly elected? Yeah, are, are you, I'm getting a lot of static. Is it just on my end or can you guys still Let, hear? Let's see, let's try something really quick. Sorry. Did that make it go away? Yeah. Perfect, okay. awesome. We, we found this, mess, this, this mystery. <laughs> Um, yeah. Sorry about that. It doesn't, by uh, the way, it doesn't come through on the recording. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. For us um, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, Joe Biden is the commander in chief. Um, you know, I trust um, the Supreme Court. Um, you know, Donald Trump had three nominees on the Supreme Court. It's the most conservative Supreme Court we've had um, in living memory. So uh, they uh, they looked at the election. They thought that it uh, was the, the right result. Um, you know, I, uh, I as Madison said, there were certain issues. You know, they changed rules in Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, um, they didn't necessarily go through the right mechanics to do that. So I think that gave some people uh, were, were disappointed with that um, because election laws are critical and and. and Going through the right steps is, is necessary um, in order for everyone to to believe in the result. Thank you. Did you have one more, Aaron? Um, no, we're at the conclusion of the questions. I just wanted to thank you both for taking the time. I know that there's a lot of it's a crowded field and it's uh, there's a big pull on your time and uh, appreciate both of you uh, stepping out and answering our questions today. Well, we thank you guys for one last chance to say whatever we didn't get to. Uh, sure, Jimmy, <laughs> let's start with you. How about uh, a minute and a half on anything we might have missed? Um, well, I just want to thank you guys for doing this. It's really important for voters. Um, when people like yourselves do a deep dive, um, it matters. And, you know, I, I care deeply about this state. Um, I've worked really hard over the last 10 years to try and make this a better place. Um, and I think that there are, um, we're facing daunting issues, you know, 40-year uh, highs in inflation, 35-year highs in illegal immigration. Um, the most people have been displaced in Europe in over 80 years since World War II. Um, we, are, we are faced with some daunting issues across the globe. Um, and I think it's gonna get worse before it gets better. And so we need people in Congress representing Oregon that, that know these issues um, and that care deeply about this state. You know, as a seventh generation Oregonian, um, as I said, I don't have the option to move to Idaho. So I'm gonna stay here and fight for as long as it takes. And, uh, and I wanna thank you guys for taking the time to do this forum. It really matters. Thank you. Likewise. Madison? Hi. Yeah, thank you guys for having me on. Um, obviously, I can use all the publicity I can get. <laughs> um, and I appreciate everything that everybody's uh, been pretty nice and cordial to me being my first run at any political office. So I do appreciate that. And uh, I've just wanted to be that voice for Oregon. Uh, we need somebody to go in there and stand up and um, stand up for Oregon. And whether, you know, we're getting stuff that we want done through all the people or not, we still need somebody to stand up and be that voice. And uh, I hope I can be that guy and earn the vote. Um, I'm here to protect everybody's individual freedoms, whether they agree with me or not. Um, we all have freedoms that were given to us by God. And that's what I'm here to hopefully protect. Um, and I appreciate you guys having us on. Great. Thank you so much.